everyone. Welcome to Hats and Horses lecture series number four. I think it's four. I'm going to go with four. Um, thanks for joining us. Today our topic is supporting at-risk youth populations. So that would be primarily looking at our Changing Leads program and the kinds of writers that we see in that program, which is very good for right now because that's the program that's easiest to do social distance and sanitizing with, needing not as much physical support. So that's where a lot of our writers right now are coming from the Changing Leads program. Um, we have two different speakers today. We have Nicolette, who's one of our instructors, who teaches, I think, primarily, if not exclusively, with the Changing Leads classes. Um, and then we, I think primarily, she does some TR. And then we also have Maria Garcia, who's one of our interns from this last spring semester, and will be back for the school year as well. Um, working, remind me your major again, Maria, you psychology. Um, so I was human services at uh, UNC, but now that I'm at DU, it's social work. Yeah. So they're both going to be chatting about that for us. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Nicolette and Maria. We are recording, so the audio from this is going to be publicized on the website with the slides, but your faces will not, so don't worry. We like that balance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it a game. Guess, your, guess the voice, right? <laughs> And there is the text-based text chat function, so if you want to ask a question or say something while one of our speakers is speaking and not interrupt, you can say it there and I can respond to any questions that you have. Okay, just, I forgot, where do we, okay, I forgot where we do the chat. Never mind, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so please throw your questions in there. I'll try to stop a couple of times in case you want to ask something that's direct to what's just come up. But otherwise, throw it in the chat. That'll help you remember it. Emmy can either answer it or maybe bring it up when it seems appropriate. Does that sound? Yeah. Sounds great. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to get the slides pulled up now that we're all on here. Share my screen. Down. All right. And the way uh, we're going to run this today, I'm going to start out with um, giving you an overview of understanding those with trauma, understanding why do we care about somebody's trauma in their life and what effects that has and how we can be aware of it. And then Maria is going to take it and apply it um, a little more specifically to what you guys are doing at Hearts and Horses, to being with the riders um, and their horses and how that you might then see how that really helps to bridge horses in this whole thing. So let me get her rolling. So trauma. So one, one way that we've studied the effects of trauma, uh, this big study called the ACEs study, maybe you've heard of it or not. Um, and ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And this image here gives an overview. It's, it's a really long one, so I don't have all of it. We're going to dive into it a little closer. But in that study, they looked at um, a whole bunch of adults. Oh, hold on, let me get somebody else joining us. Uh, a whole bunch of adults that um, they asked them about their previous experiences in their childhood and certain questions that indicated whether or not they had these three major categories of trauma in their life. So abuse, it be physical, emotional, or sexual, neglect, physical or emotional, physical meaning like a lack of food or a lack of quality food, um, that sort of thing, and household dysfunction, um, family members with mental illness, uh, violence with the mother, divorced parents, um, uh, and relatives that are incarcerated, and then obviously substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, that sort of thing. And so they asked him, did you have these things in your life? Uh, through a specific test. Let's see, come on, keep going. There it goes. And um, what they found is that the more of these sorts of different um, experiences. So if you had physical abuse and you had parents that were divorced, that would be two ACEs. Or you had neglect, emotional neglect, and um, um, and your, you know, there was physical abuse of your mom or something like that. Those added up. The more of those that you had in your life as a child, 
the more risk, the more negative health outcomes you had as an adult. And so such possible outcomes are lack of activity, um, alcohol abuse and drug abuse, um, not being reliable to go to work, suffering from even just diseases like strokes and uh, heart disease and cancer strongly linked to the number of um, childhood adverse experiences that adults had. So in the end of this study, they found that one in six people reported having four or more ACEs. And having four or more ACEs meant that they had a lot of health issues. So this is like a societal health crisis of these things happening when kids are young is leading to adults who need major health support. Um, um, just that link together. And there, this is not just a, um, you know, a, a social economical issue or a lack of education or a minority situation. I mean, these majority of these people had some sort of college education, they were middle class, and they were mostly Caucasian in this study. Uh, so it's the people, you know, that were all, it's, it's a whole societal look. Um, and um, um, and so these ACEs impact the child's ability to develop and be successful and then have a healthier adult life. So let's put ourselves in, now into the shoes of a person that has had um, trauma, a youth that has these adverse experiences happening to them. And so imagine you're out on the countryside and you're having a nice little picnic and everything and all of a sudden there's a bear. A giant grizzly bear has just showed up and is roaring and coming at you, okay? As people, we have a reaction to that. And one might be you, well, so you're gonna, you're gonna start to race and get, you know, nervous and you're gonna stress out, right? Your body's immediately gonna realize the stress, the danger, and you might go into flight or fight. You might go into fight and you might get prepared with your cheese knife to go take on the bear. That might be you. You might decide it's better to run. Um, you're gonna flee. You're gonna run from the situation of that bear and uh, no matter what, whether you can beat the bear or not, your choice is flight. That is what you do. Um, and you don't always have control over these. Or you might freeze. You might just shut down and, you know, curl up and just hope that bear goes away. And that's your response. And so your stress response has kicked in and each person can handle it differently. And so with youth who have had bears, in as they've been growing up all these these adverse experiences they start to see bears everywhere they start to feel like well if the adults at home are doing that won't the adults here do that you know if that uh situation was bad to me at home it's probably bad to me everywhere and they're looking out for it so all sorts of things can become bears and like noises, loud noises, or somebody brushing you, even by accident, can be a trigger like a bear is attacking you. And so um, you might, you know, kids might have a touch, trigger, bear, that's a bear to them. That feels like somebody's attacking them and they're going to have a response of fight, flight, or freeze. Um, talking loud, a raised voice. Somebody just hollers across to get your attention, but that to that kid is a bear because somebody in their life maybe always yelled at them and they bad things happened after that. An angry look, a perceived slight, a change in routine, can be a trigger that, hey, something bad's gonna happen. That acts like a bear. Some kids, it's a change in noise, so it could be silence. When things are chaotic, that's normal. But as soon as things get quiet, bad things happen, and that's their bear. 
So they're always prepared, always looking for these things because they happen and then they respond. Their body automatically responds in a version of fight, flight, or freeze. So um, imagine a child that walks into the classroom and is constantly ready to fight, flight, or freeze because that's what they've grown up with. That's what they know is they have to always be ready to defend themselves. So their behaviors may be unpredictable, they may be overreactive, they may avoid work, they shut down, uh, they may leave the space or withdraw or refuse and don't ask. And they're just seeing bears everywhere instead of seeing a healthy environment. So you don't know what their bear looks like, but if you can tell that they've seen a bear, then they're going to see them elsewhere. So in a classroom environment, you know, it's not going to be the same on a countryside where you run into a bear and kind of, you know, the, the way that flight, fight and freeze looks. But in a classroom environment, flight might just be withdrawing, just not talking anymore, just kind of trying to avoid getting noticed. It might be totally not showing up for class. That's flight. It might be pretending um, or looking like you're just, your mind is just gone. Your mind is just wandered off to some other place. That kid, um, it might be avoiding, avoiding you, avoiding other kids, just staying out of uh, there. Whereas with fight, uh, you know, those ones are pretty obvious to you. You know, the kids start to argue back. They start to yell. They uh, get aggressive in their behavior, you know, maybe, hit somebody. That's their way of, of fighting whatever is triggering them um, or being defiant or just kind of silly, just kind of crazy is their way of fighting. Um, or freeze where they just refuse to talk back, refuse to participate and totally just act like they're not even there. Like, not that they're daydreaming, they just, like, are gone. They're just blank. Um, so those sorts of reactions can happen. They can look different in different kids um, when they're acting in, in, um, in a state of fear, in a state of being on guard. Um, oh, hold on. I got to kind of shift this. Let me move this over here. Um, so young children are impacted by adverse experiences and spend much of their time in a low level state of fear. So if they're having these adverse childhood experiences when they're young, then they are staying in this state of, oh my gosh, the world could come at me. There could be a bear anywhere at any time and they're always looking for them and they're always waiting for them because their safety depends on it. If you went up to the countryside to have that picnic and you saw that bear and you got away and then you had to go back to that same spot, you had to, I'm sure you would be sitting around looking for a bear again. You would not be enjoying your lunch as much because where is that bear? You saw it before it happened before it could happen again. Um, and so students then start to um, interpret things that are normal for socially for the rest of us as things that are awful for them, that they don't understand that that has been a problem somewhere else. You know, if the average person, maybe that bear was totally random up on the countryside, every other person that comes to that same spot to have that picnic is not going to worry about a bear. And they're going to think about a bear and they're going to enjoy their time up there and they will probably think you're crazy for sitting there thinking there's going to be a bear. But you have that bear there and that is always going to stay with you. So then as educators, knowing what some kids bring with them to the school environment we can change the way we look at our students, the way we think about what's going on. And so one of uh, this quote here is really nice. The belief that a person has control over his complete control over their behavior leads to someone else like us as the educator, or the support adult, 
to being coming angry or or disappointed in that person when their behavior gets off. So when they start to act in a flight, flight, a flight, fight, or freeze mode, we can go, well, uh, I mean, come on, why don't you behave? This is supposed to be fun. Instead of going, well, maybe it's not completely in their control. Maybe they're reacting to what they know, what they have experienced. And so we change the perspective from what's wrong with you? Why are you, you know, um, what's wrong with you that you're doing that? Why can't you just pay attention? Why can't you just participate to, whoa, what has happened in the past? What has happened to you that has made you so worried about a bear on the countryside, right? Out in the middle where there's never brown bears. Why would you be so worried about that? And how can I support you so you can start to not worry about that bear anymore? Um, so some examples of this um, in the classroom is if you, if you aren't thinking about what has happened to them, then you might think, well, they're just lazy or unresponsive or you just can't control them. Whereas if you're informed about what might be in their past, what might be going on for them, you're thinking, oh, what, what just triggered that kid? And their, their response is to shut down. Something triggered them and shut them down or they 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 don't trust an adult they're destructive and they are impolite and disrespectful because they've never had an adult in their life that ever respected and that they could ever trust and so it becomes more about what is that environment done instead of how is that kid you know what's wrong with that kid what what is going on in the environment and how can the environment support them so that kid can have healthier experiences? And so if you're uninformed, it might be immediately going to consequences and, and medication and that sort of thing. Whereas with an informed response, we might say, hey, because of what's happened in this child's past, they need skills to help them regulate their emotions. They need skills to they need people around them that can support them to make healthier decisions or to teach them trust or to show them that this is not a bear this is actually a pleasant experience that seems like because of your previous experience um so some of this um and maybe maria We'll have some to add, or she's got some some nice videos and stuff that she can, um, or insights into the brain. But as I'm raising kids, my young boys, I kind of relate them a little bit to this. So a lot of this, a lot of these behaviors I see frequently in my young boys, but with their, but that's normal development. Whereas a kid with trauma, isn't able to learn and develop out of those behaviors, learn better ways of handling, learn how to regulate their emotions because the, they're so on guard all the time, they can't learn, they can't use the front of their brain, they can only use their instinctive brain. And so my kids with healthy environments are, I can see them start to move out of these behaviors. And a lot of kids that we see in Changing Leads are still not able to move out of those behaviors and learn other behaviors because of their environment. Um, so that kind of, you know, this is all normal behavior and they've been delayed, they've been stuck or never even shown a proper way because the environment around them doesn't provide them example. Um, so some, some ways of looking at things differently, of having a trauma lens, here's some examples. So if you have uh, a kid that's just staring off and not listening, you might think to yourself, oh, well, he just doesn't want to learn. He doesn't like the subject or he doesn't like learning. Instead, it may be that it's really challenging for that kid to learn, to take in new information because they're sitting there waiting for something awful to happen to them. Um, maybe a, a student is very defensive 
everything you put at her. She's got an excuse. She's coming back at you. And you might, you know, think about that, or you might say, hey, maybe this kid has a really time, hard time articulating what they need, their, uh, her feelings. And she's using her language to build a wall because that protects her from what potentially could be a bad adult relationship, a lack of trust. Um, another student that did the, does this thing right the day before and then the next day totally does it wrong. Maybe they're supposed to ask to go to the restroom and she just gets up and walks off and you're like, what is the deal? You know better. You've heard this. You did it right yesterday. You asked properly. Why is it not happening today? And it could be a limited sense of cause and effect. They've never gotten a good sense of I do this and this happens because their previous environments have never been consistent. Like some days if I ask to go to the restroom, it's good. And the other days when I ask at home to go to the restroom, I get in trouble. So it's never consistent. So they don't understand true cause and effect or a sense of self-efficacy. Or here's another one. The This uh, student is just so impulsive. Maybe every time you... You know, the kid is walking down the aisle and they just grab toys and they grab things off of people's desks or something like that. And so this kid may have a delayed problem solving and may have poor social skills. Those things have never been developed. They've never been helped. Um, and that may be the reasons via the trauma that this child has um, come to. So kind of one little little piece as I'm um, finishing up with this, this idea is we're looking at things through like a broader lens, like what is missing? What has happened and how can I support this kid to make better choices instead of automatically going to consequences? And I don't, that doesn't mean that the, um, student gets to have that bad behavior. You know, if a kid hits somebody, okay, the reason behind that kid hitting is good to know, but it's still not okay to hit somebody, right? So we've got to balance this idea of, no, we don't get to hit, but I'm not going to just punish you and tell you you're, you're doing it wrong. I'm going to think about how to support and fix what's really wrong underneath there. And, and that's always a fun, uh, thing to work through, a fun thing to, um, you know, it's not always black and white. It can be very child specific, which makes it a little harder um, to work with. So let me, uh, I'm going to pull out of these slides here and pull up Maria's. Does anybody have any questions about that much so far about what I've put out? Let me see if I can see everybody. Do we have any questions in the box, Emmy? Okay. Oh, we got them all right. <laughs> A good idea. All right. Well, Maria, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Do you want to just say next and I'll click the slide? Okay. Yeah. Uh, sure, that works great. Uh, thank you, Nicolette, for that presentation. Um, so a little bit about my background before we begin. Um, I worked at the Safe House in Loveland, Alternatives to Violence, and that's where I kind of learned a lot about um, kids coming into the Safe House, having experienced child abuse or having those ACEs like Nicolette mentioned. Um, I worked with my other, the other intern, Alex, um, and she had a background in working with kids at camp. Um, so just to give y'all that basis for us and we can get started. Want me to go to the next one? Yes. Okay. Um, so we just wanted to talk about what classifies an at-risk youth. So an at-risk youth is a child who is less likely to transition to, um, to a successful adulthood due to past experiences, trauma, or social determinants. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, social determinants are basically the circumstances you're born into or the cards you're dealt. So that, you know, um, how economically stable the family you're born into is. Do you have health access to health care? Do you have access to education? Are you living in a safe neighborhood and environment? Um, 
And these determinants could affect uh, the kids' act academic success, their ability to become financially independent, and their ability to become a positive member of society by avoiding a life of crime. Um, we can go ahead and go next. Okay, so some types of trauma and experiences, I know Nicolette um, brushed over these two, so that's witnessing violence in the home, domestic violence, sexual assault, experiencing child abuse or neglect, um, sexual abuse, even having a family member or a close friend attempt or die by suicide, and having your parents experience child abuse or neglect can contribute to the trauma that you have as a child growing up. Next. So these are just some at-risk youth tendencies. Um, risky behaviors, they're often looking for an escape. So a lot of times they'll abuse substances, some sedentary behaviors, you know, being just super into video games, but like an unhealthy amount that they're really engaged in that. They're not engaged in really anything else, um, any sports. They often misbehave at school. They act as interested. Bullying is a big one too. Oftentimes when the kid bullies, it's because there's a lot going on at home. Um, maybe they don't have the best friend group. They're not getting the best grades. Um, they're violent or they're lashing out. Like Nicolette mentioned, ignoring, just kind of withdrawing, not seeming interested in anything that's going on. Um, a lot of times these kids have uh, mental illness such as depression, anxiety, they experience panic attacks, they have thoughts of suicide, they're more withdrawn um, in certain activities. And oftentimes these kids don't have a, support, a stable support system at home and no structure to really follow a good example of, or maybe they don't have a good mentor at home. Next. So Nicolette, if you would click on this video, we included it, we just thought it was really good at how it explains childhood trauma in the brain. One thing, Nicolette, I don't know if you chose these options when you... Um... Research reveals the child's... Go ahead. There's, so there's, when you share your screen, there's an option that says optimize video and sound. They're like check boxes at the bottom. So you may want to unshare and then reshare, making sure those are checked so that we can get the best quality on the video. Okay, hold on. Um, let's see. I gotta move. Stop share. At the bottom, you said where? So when you when you hit share screen, where you're choosing which screen to share, at the bottom you should see two check boxes: one for optimizing video, and then one for sharing computer sound. So if you click both of those, that'll be your best option. Okay. Got it. Done. All right. Let me see if I can get this back up. And then you'll probably want to mute. And I'll want to mute. Yourself. Yeah. Uh, there. The emotional effects of childhood trauma are well known, but new scientific research reveals that child's positive and negative experiences can shape and reshape the brain. Research suggests that the more a child witnesses violence, the more neural connections are created in regions of the brain that involve fear, anxiety, and impulsiveness, while fewer are created in regions that involve reasoning, planning, and behavioral control. The good news is the young brain is malleable or plastic, and fostering stable, supportive relationships can prevent or help reverse this damage, resulting in lifelong benefits for the child's learning, behavior, and overall health. So how can you help a child in your life? Just remember these five healing gestures. Celebrate them with a compliment or by applauding their efforts. Comfort them by staying calm and patient. Listen to them and show an interest in their passions. Collaborate with them by asking their opinions and inspire them with new ideas. With these everyday gestures, you can help a child look forward to a bright future. Thank you. Um, and just understanding how the trauma brain reacts to certain things, um, that was kind of the purpose of the video. And it does relate a lot back to what Nicolette was saying out there and how, you know, you go to this place uh, where 
everyone goes, but there's just one person really, really afraid of the bear. And that's because maybe they've gone through trauma and the bear represents that. Next. Okay, so how to maintain a safe environment. Um, avoid physical contact unless it's initiated by the rider. For example, hugs, pats, touches, anything like that, because that could bring out their bear. Um, and just kind of respect their personal bubbles, give them space when they're working with the horse. Um, favoritism, so uh, from what I learned and everything and from what Alex had learned too, we just really discourage gift giving or reaching out outside of hearts and horses, maybe asking for their phone number or being alone off site because that could make the child uncomfortable or maybe give them a false sense of how this um, environment works. Um, Oversharing, so just remember it's not about you, the focus is on the child. Um, you can share if they ask you or if they have any tips on how to deal with the situation. I know when I was interning there, a lot of times I get asked, um, what do you do when you're angry or how do you talk to someone when you're upset? And then I would say, okay, well, you know, that can be kind of hard to do when you're angry. It's hard to not act out, but taking a step back and just maybe telling them like, this is what I normally do or saying this is um, asking bringing the question back to them and saying, well, what do you normally do when you get upset? Um, so for just another example for a writer who expresses anxiety when they say, I have struggled with anxiety since I was six years old due to bullying. So remember what helped your anxiety. So for me, that would be try taking a deep breath and notice your surroundings first. I know there's um, one thing I did intend to put in this is I, it's like, Think about five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and then it's like one deep breath at the end or something like that. Um, next. Okay, so how to de-escalate. Sometimes um, the writers will, um, like when they see their bear, I guess they'll escalate a little bit, whether that's they start yelling, they start crying. You notice they're about to have an anxiety attack or a panic attack. One thing to do is just ask your rider to breathe, close your eyes, inhale for four seconds, hold for six seconds, and exhale for seven seconds. Ask questions, you know, what emotions are you feeling? What made you feel this way? Did something come up? Um, it's okay if they don't want to talk about it, so don't try to force them to, um, but allow them to find a space and let them know that it is okay to, you know, take a step back and take a break. Um, it's always okay to give the rider the option to dismount. Um, and another good thing is to find an instructor or ask a volunteer to get the instructor's attention, just to let them know what's going on so that the instructor can keep track of everything in the arena. Um, and just the big thing, don't leave the rider alone. Um, again, like maintain that space bubble, but I would discourage don't let them like go off by themselves. Next. Okay, so um, these are just some helpful responses to what happens to like what you can say when a writer is starting to escalate in their emotions. So just asking open-ended questions um, or even just trying to make connections to the writer. You can ask open-ended questions like what, where do you see yourself five years from now? Um, or affirming like acknowledging what they're going through, recognizing it. And then just saying like, you know, I know that you're having a hard time, but hey, you did a really good weaving through the cones today. Like that's a really big accomplishment. Um, making sure you're really complimenting them and encouraging them is always good. Um, Cause sometimes they don't get that recognition at home. Um, like I said, when they're telling you stuff that's, you know, really deep, it's, you know, it sounds like you've lost a lot. Um, it sounds like that doesn't really seem right to you. How, what can I do to help? And just some other rules for, we call it motivational interviewing, like resist telling them what to do, understand their motivations and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, listen with empathy and then empower them by giving them that encouragement. Like you're going over the rules today. I'm really proud of you. You've improved so much. 
things like that can really go a long way. Next. Um, so Alex and I had originally planned to do a partner activity pre COVID when we wanted to do this in person with all of you. And it's really just um, find a partner next to you. We were going to pass out note cards saying like, you know, you're the rider, you're the horse leader. And then let's say a scenario where the rider just isn't feeling it that day. They don't want to talk. They don't want to engage. And um, we would have the other person practice asking those open-ended questions. What's going on today? Um, one thing I really like that we do at Hearts and Horses is the um, uh, feeling emotional squares. Is that what they're called? Correct me if I'm wrong. Where the mood the mood squares, where they get to circle. Um, like you know, I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling happy today. And then at the end we of the lesson, we do that again to see if anything's changed. So I really love that. Um, affirming that they did everything right that day, like you did great with grooming, I'm really proud of you, things like that. And then just summarizing what they're going through. Like, I know you're going through a lot right now at home. Um, I know things may be difficult, but you're doing a great job. I'm really proud of you. Just again, like affirming, affirming everything they're doing right. Next. Um, I would so say this could be something that you could always do, like if you have some extra time before class and you're hanging out with another volunteer, you could always talk through, hey, I, I found this situation last week in class, do you mind role playing with me to see if I can figure out a good way to, to deal with, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's always good to practice that stuff. Um, so these are just some mental health questions that a lot of the kiddos we see are dealing with, so anxiety and it kind of explains that anxiety is just a built up of energy and how to help. So keep space, you know, watch your body language. Um, even as something as simple as a shoulder tap could be a triggering. So maybe just avoid touching and just reflecting like, it seems like that was hard. Would you like to take a minute and think of what we could do differently? Or focus on the horse, for example, what do you think Romeo would like to do? How do you think Romeo is feeling today? Um, I saw that you tightened your reins to get more control. That's great. How did you feel? How did that make you feel? Um, depression can be a feeling of numbness. Um, so some good things to do is just, you know, always be there to listen, support, avoid giving advice or just saying it's okay or it'll pass or if they're not answering the questions. I know we sometimes have prompted questions during lessons with the obstacles. So uh, maybe try to avoid the like, I can't help you if you don't tell me what's wrong, um, but just rather try to keep them engaged and reflect back on how they're feeling. Again, it's always good to put the focus back on the horse. Like I know Romeo's really excited to see you today. He's been waiting all week. How do you think he's feeling? Are you like, how are you feeling about seeing Romeo? Um, PTSD, feeling detached um, or loss of, or feeling that you've lost yourself. So. Some good things to do is promoting relaxation, breathing, petting the equine. One time I remember during the lesson, the kids put their hands on where you can feel the horse breathe and try to match their breathing with that. And that even made me feel a lot more calm. So um, I'm sure that's a great activity to do as well. And just saying, you know, some affirmations for that. Wow, Romeo responded super great to you today. I noticed your energy really kept him going. Next, um, just these are my references uh, that we all used. And if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Okay, well, thank you guys so Hi, much. Carol, I have a question. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Unmute, Carol. I think Nicolette, you should be able to unmute her as well as host. Uh, I think I got her. Come on. I don't know why it's not. Oh, there we oh. go. There you go. Oh, wait, we just, it went back on. Too many of us. I think it's being delayed. <laughs> there, there we go. go. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Perfect.
But for instance, would the instructor say to the writer, you said, you know, don't, don't give orders or, you know, don't tell the writer what to do. Would the instructor, if, if the writer is supposed to hold the reins up, would the instructor say, Johnny, hold your reins up? Or would, how would she verbalize that to him? Do you see what I'm asking? We're not supposed to like, um, you know, give him orders so, so that it's belittling him. Okay, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think when it's more of a technical question, and Nicolette, you can feel free to chime into this. Um, as far as you know, hold the reins more correctly, sit up straighter. I think that is totally okay. Um, okay. It's more is that so? Is that okay then? So that's what the instructor does. Then would a sidewalker try to enforce that by saying, "Johnny, hold your reins up." Or is that not something for the sidewalker to be doing? That'd be something that the instructor would do it in a professional way. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's okay for the sidewalker or the horse leader to just, just kind of reinforce what the instructor's saying. Like, hey, like, remember to hold your reins up so that you have better control. Okay, so that's okay to word it like that. Remember what Nicolette said, hold your reins up. That's okay to say it like that to him. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, you, you as a sidewalker, maybe maybe they miss the information, so you're providing EP. Um, maybe they didn't quite understand, so maybe okay. you speak the way it's said a little bit right. to help them understand it, or offering the why, or repeating the why. Why or okay. why does it matter where our hands is? It's not really a, I wouldn't call it a reinforced, like we're not trying to like, you got to do this. I mean, it's right. a safety thing, and then the, the instructor should be involved. But it's more of a, I'm just going to guide, you know, oh, did they miss that? And keep okay. in mind, they might be delayed, like have delay processing, right? right. So you might go, oh, well, you're supposed to move your hands, move your hands, move your hands. And you got to give them a couple of seconds. The more you know your rider, the more you know, did they just totally miss it? Okay. Or delayed or are they unmotivated for some reason? Okay. Um, <clears throat> can you guys hear me? Yeah, go for it. Hey, it isn't blinking, so I didn't know if I was being heard. One thing I'm wondering um, that I've had work is first to ask the um, writer what they heard to see if what they picked up was what the, the um, instructor said. And then you can kind of see if there's a difference. Another thing is um, move everything into questions. So where do you think your hands need to be? Mm. Um, so it starts, they start having ownership right. of okay. the uh, action rather than responding to being told. Does that okay. That's a good idea like that. Okay. Yeah. And that can really depend on, on the writer, on the age, the cognitive ability. You know, when we get into our changing leads, middle schoolers, that's great, great ways, you know, asking questions about, as reminders, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you notice, I, I sometimes I just point out what I see. Do you notice that your hands are like here? You know, do you notice that? Mm -hmm. Instead of put your hands down, put your hands down, put your hands down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good question. Um, I was gonna throw out uh, just a note that when you're going with a writer that you're unfamiliar with, when you're starting with a uh, writer that has a trauma background, uh, you believe um, you're unfamiliar or you've been struggling with them, then I just really recommend having a conversation with the instructor, finding a way, you know, just tug on us until we, we pay attention <laughs> to have that conversation and, and ask, you know, some ideas about what are some of their triggers. Maybe the instructor has some ideas about what things do trigger them and how to respond to them. And depending on the writer, then you might also be able to ask the writer themselves. Some of our changing leads that have been through the eight weeks program, then they're in a place where they can almost look to the volunteer and say, okay, these are the things that bug me mm -hmm. and here's how you can help me or here's how I'm working on helping myself. So having those conversations yeah. um, ahead can help you prepare for some of the um, tools that Maria gave you. So. Yeah, so I was wondering if it was appropriate to ask what type of background uh, my writer 
has because I, you know, I don't know. And it's Lauren. So, you know. Yes, you can ask the instructor and they will share whatever is appropriate. And do you want to add to that, Emmy? Yeah, I was just going to say we are working for the fall session, um, hopefully for the fall session, to start, I'm hoping to start doing kind of a pre-session training where you would come in the week before classes start as your volunteer team to kind of give us a chance to go over some of the horse things that might have changed in the last session, and then also to give you a chance to really powwow with your instructor and learn about your riders and what's the plan for the session and kind of have everyone on the same page before we start. Yeah. So That's going to be really helpful. If it doesn't happen for fall, it's definitely happen happening for spring, but there's a lot going on with fall. That's the goal though. That's what I'm okay. shooting for. Okay, thank you. You can always fall back to a little bit of less is more, you know what I mean? It's always better to give more bubble or say less and have that child be like, I need more, I need more. And then you can, you can add to it. But if you give them too much, it's just more, you know what I mean? It's hard to take it back. You can always start with less and give more as that kid seems like they're asking for it or comfortable. Less. And to expand yeah. on that less is more idea, I'd say in some respects, information on the writer's background does fall on that, that too. That's kind of where the instructor, you'll notice instructor might not give you as much information as you feel like you're ne you need. But one of the advantages of you guys as volunteers and the roles that you have with our writers out here is you are outside of their experiences. You're not enmeshed in it. You're not a part of the trauma. You're something separate. And so sometimes not knowing can actually be a good thing. So you may yeah. find that your instructor might not share things on purpose because they feel like you not knowing, not having that information, that filter, that file on the writer could actually be really beneficial for the, for the interaction. That really makes a lot of sense. It does. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the kids don't want labels. They don't want to be known as the kid that lost their dad or the kid whose parents were divorced. You know? so, yeah. so you being that person who takes them just as they are in that moment without knowing about all the stuff beforehand can actually be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and would that be up to each instructor to give that information, like, um, let's see, what am I, how am I trying to word this? That, okay, let's use Nicolette, that you would decide, you know, Carol's not asking, so I guess I just won't give her that, you know, give her any more information unless she's asking me what she wants to know. Or do you just volunteer to pass on the information? In, in general, I volunteer to pass on what I think is needed for success. Okay. So if a child has lost a parent, but that has no impact, like they, that's just not really relevant to a good ride or your relationship to them, then I, I'm probably not going to offer that up. Except that I may, you know, just say something about, so, you know, did you and your parents go on a vacation, you know, and there I'm not knowing that the parent died. But, yeah. but how often do, or is that kid gonna run into somebody that doesn't know their parents are dead and going to have somebody trigger that? So wouldn't that be nice for them to role play through that with you? Okay. Them, them offering up that information and them not thinking, oh, well, everybody around here knows my parents died. They'll go, oh, she didn't know. That was honest. You've probably built a relationship with that person. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, like kid, yeah. In this situation, that can be a really great step towards adulthood and dealing with, yeah, I mean, I, I have people that say to me all the time, oh, your parents, what are your parents? You know, well, my dad died five years ago. And so you, you know, I don't expect everybody to know that. And right. how do I learn socially? <laughs> And that's, that's a, that would be a good example of what Maria said. It's not about me. And so by me having that information, I'm, what I'm trying to do is then I'm going to avoid that particular question. But it's about how that person is going to react to my question. So that was a good point, Maria. And then for Nicolette, for you to say it like that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Gives me the goosebumps, as a matter of fact. Yeah. It's really fresh. They're really young. They're not that, you know, then I'm probably going to say, Hey, you know, you need to know this. This is sensitive and this will yeah. trigger this. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, and, and since it's all, it's new to me, and so I was, you know, wanting to bond with Lauren, and I said, so how was your week? And so she said, oh, it was pretty good. She said, I went to my group therapy, and then I went to my therapist. So, you know, she let me know that, and that she was meeting with her cousins and aunts later at IHOP. So, you know, she was opening up a little bit. But then I was thinking too, am I distracting her from focusing on writing? Because we're talking, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit. So and I was trying to figure out the balance of bonding her and so she feels comfortable with me, but not distracting her from her lesson, you know? Yeah, and a lot of that comes down to timing of sometimes, you know, like, at the beginning of class when everyone's getting mounted so the instructor's focusing just on that one writer that's getting mounted and you're kind of warming up and walking around that's a great time to have those conversations and catch up and then once everyone's on focusing on the class and same thing with dismounting too that kind of finding those natural times in class where you aren't actively doing an activity you're not working on a writing skill so that you have that chance to chat and then you can focus on the on the class activities and it may depend on the goals for that writer so if you talk to the instructor, I mean, if that writer having a bond with a positive bond with the adult is really important, then you might have some wiggle room to have that social be a little more. And it, it kind of, you know, depends on the flow of the class. And you can even ask, like, it seems like she just really needs some time to still talk. Mm -hmm. Talk to the instructor. Instructor's like, no, 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 she really needs this too, so we're going to balance it. Or maybe the instructor's like, why don't I get her on last so you guys can have more spill time, more share, mm -hmm. and, and then you can get into writing. Mm -hmm. So it just, you know, if you see something that we may not be seeing because of talking to them, talk to the instructor and, and evaluate what their goal is. Yeah, and that, that's what I was, like, like she would say to me, I want to trot so bad, or you know, why can't we use the whole arena? She's just because she's ridden before at, at Hearts and Horses. And I said, you know what? Why don't we ask Brenda? You know, because those are questions for Brenda, you know. And uh, so she seemed a little bit, a little bit shy, you know, about that. But mm -hmm. then you're teaching her self advocacy. So she's learning how to advocate for what she wants and needs. Okay. And then even if the answer is no, then you can support her through the disappointment, you know, or, or the, hey, I advocated and I got it, the success. You can be there for both, just right alongside her, through it. That's awesome. Okay. Okay. Good, good info for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything, Maria, you wanted to add to any of that? No, that was great. Um, sorry, my roommate's cat Zelda made an appearance. I'm sitting in her favorite chair, so uh, I'm trying to establish her territory here. Um, yeah, with her tail. <laughs> but no, like I know I went through that pretty quickly. Um, public speaking is not my strong suit, and while I, I'm comfortable with you all, it still just like gets to me sometimes, so thank you so much for your patience with all that and that's why I like to have questions afterwards because I'm like oh yeah like I forgot to say this so yeah that was great thank you <laughs> um is there any way we can get copies of the slides from both of you they're really really helpful I was taking notes but I didn't get it all down yep I can send out slides and they'll be on the recording too once that's live on the website so if in like six months you can't find the copy of slides you can go look at the recording Okay. okay, great. Thank this you. Good. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, this well, is thank great. You all for being here. Thank you so much. We appreciate everything you do and love that you are paying attention to your writers and taking the time to learn how to support them. That makes that you know, it's really I mean, the instructors set it up, but that relationship for those changing leads kids between you and them that's the magic. You, them, and the horse. It's a triangle of, of magic. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I'll share one little tidbit. This was, who, one of the interns shared this with me, that there was some research that she had seen or been a part of or something like that, that showed that part of the reason why the horse, adult, youth, triangle works 
is because a horse is subservient, you know, right? Or, you know, the animal, you know, under the adult. And if the adult and the horse can get along, if the horse trusts the adult, then the kid says, hey, I can trust that adult too, because the horse does. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So that's mm -hmm. part of the, the magic, just a little a little snippet to take with you that you, how good your relationship is with that horse. And that can be on both sides, setting boundaries with a horse that's being pushy or mm -hmm. creating comfort for a horse that's feeling intimidated or showing empathy for that horse. Your relationship with that horse is what then bonds you, that student initially, and then eventually you get your own bond, so. That's neat, thank you.